This is the scene of the crime. A crime of passion, filmed in a way you have never seen before. And as no one else would dare attempt, but the screen's master of suspense, the producer-director who shocked the world with Psycho. This is the apartment of a man named Jeffries, a news photographer whose beat used to be the world. Right now, his world has shrunk down to the size of this window. He's been watching the people across the way. Nobody seems to pull their blinds during a hot spell like this. He knows a lot about them by now. Too much, perhaps. For instance, down there on the second floor, the woman pacing about. He calls her Miss Lonely Hearts, so lonely that even death seems like a friend. These are the newlyweds on a honeymoon no one will ever forget. He calls her Miss Hearing Aid, an artist of a very odd and strange art. The songwriter who plays the same melody over and over again. A genius or insane? This is the traveling salesman and his invalid wife. Out of their arguments and nagging comes a weird kind of love. Miss Torso, the body beautiful. That is, viewed from a safe distance. Those are just a few of my neighbors. First, I watched them just to kill time, but then I couldn't take my eyes off them, just as you won't be able to. And you won't be able to take your eyes off the glowing beauty of Grace Kelly, who shares the heart and curiosity of James Stewart in this story of a romance shadowed by the terror of a horrifying secret. Good afternoon. Here we have a quiet little motel tucked away off the main highway and as you see perfectly harmless looking when in fact it has now become known as the scene of the crime. This motel also has as an adjunct an old house, which is, if I may say so, a little more sinister looking, less innocent than the motel itself. And in this house, the most dire, horrible events took place. I think we can go inside because the place is up for sale, although I don't know who's going to buy it now. In that window on the second floor, the single one in front, that's where the woman was first seen. Let's go inside. You see, even in daylight, this place still looks a bit sinister. Now, it was at the top of these stairs that the second murder took place. She came out of the door there and met the victim at the top. Of course, in a flash, there was the knife, and in no time, the victim tumbled and fell with a horrible crash. I think the bat broke immediately and hit the floor. It was, it's difficult to describe the way that the, 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 the twisting of the, of the, well, I, it's, uh, I won't dwell upon it, but let, let, come upstairs. 
Of course, the victim, or should I say victims, hadn't any conception as to the type of people they would be confronted with in this house, especially the woman. She was the weirdest and the most... Well, well let's go into her bedroom. Here's the woman's room, still beautifully preserved. And the imprint of her figure on the bed where she used to lay. I think some of her clothes are still in this wardrobe. was the son's room, but uh, we won't go in there because his favorite spot was the little parlor behind his office in the motel. Let's go down there. This young man, you had to feel sorry for him. After all, being dominated by an almost maniacal woman was enough to drive anyone to the extreme of... Uh, uh, well, let's go in. Well, I suppose you'd call this his hideaway. His hobby, as you see, was taxidermy. Crow here, an owl there. Now, an important scene took place in this room. There was a private supper here. And, uh, oh, by the way, this picture has great significance because... Uh, let's go along to cabin number one. I want to show you something there. All tidied up. bathroom. Well, I cleaned all this up now. Big difference. You should have seen the blood. The whole, the whole place was, well, it's, it's too horrible to describe. Dreadful. And I'll tell you, there's a very important clue was found here. Down there. Well, the murderer, you see, crept in here very slowly. Of course, the shower was on, there was no sound. And, The Detroit News said it's the best crime play in years. The London Daily Mail headlined, a murder thriller with a difference. The New York Daily Mirror wrote, it holds your attention like a vice. Where's the nearest police station? What could you tell them? 
I should simply tell them that you're trying to blackmail me into... Into? Murdering your wife. Fantastic, isn't it? But you know he's right, don't you, Tony? You've worked it out to the smallest detail. And this man is to be your murder weapon for the perfect crime. And you, Margot, you've been living dangerously, too dangerously, a married woman with a two-party line to your affections. And Mark, ironic, isn't it, that in this design for death, you should be selected to be the perfect alibi for the murder of the woman you love. Are you ever going to tell Tony about us? I couldn't possibly tell him. Not now. There is evidence, however, that he was blackmailing you. Blackmail? Yes, I'm afraid it's true, Tony. And you suggest that he came in by the window. And we know that he came in by that door. But he can't have come in that way. That door was locked. You could have let him in. I'm an advertising man, not a red herring. I've got a job, a secretary, a mother, two ex-wives, and several bartenders dependent upon me. And I don't intend to disappoint them all by getting myself slightly killed. You can't fight it, Carrie. Someone's out to get you, by violence or by abduction. They'll even frame you for murder. So run for your life. Search for a man who doesn't exist, a secret nobody knows and start a love affair in an upper berth. Hello there. Tell me, why are you so good to me? Shall I climb up and tell you why? A train may be an old-fashioned way to make a getaway. But who wants to get away from an exquisite, inquisitive blonde? How do I know you aren't a murderer? You don't. Eva Marie Saint seems to enjoy Carrie's romantic performance. But her companion, James Mason, has other ideas. Ask him, Carrie. Apparently, the only performance that will satisfy you is when I play dead. In your very next role, you'll be quite convincing, I assure you. <coughs> it's one surprise after another. Adventurous Carrie, romanced by the kind of blonde that gets into a man's blood, even if she has to shoot her way in. connection between them whatsoever. Each one has somebody that he'd like to get rid of. So, they swap murders. Fantastic, isn't it? You didn't know when Bruno proposed this pact that he was serious, dead serious. You had made the mistake of speaking to a stranger on a train. And now, wherever you go, whatever you do, you find yourself dominated by his evil presence. And you, Bruno, to you, killing was the answer. Murder without clue, without motive. The perfect crime. Too perfect. And Anne, 
life look very attractive to you. Until the love in your heart became gripped by a terror that drew you deeper and deeper into this vortex of conspiracy. I have a murder on my conscience, but it's not my murder, Mr. Haynes. I wonder if you know how much I love you. Brazen woman, I'm the one to say that. And this year's Academy Award winner, Grace Kelly. Two exciting personalities who were made for each other. And now, Alfred Hitchcock brings them into very close contact in this perfect tale of romantic intrigue, filmed on the beautiful French Riviera. You have a very strong grip, the kind of burglar needs. That's why you came out here, isn't it? The scandalous romance that shocked even the blasé international set between this restless, thrill-hunting American heiress and the notorious man of mystery the French underworld called the Cat. For the game they played was not played for money, and the characters they played with played for keeps. No one but Hitchcock could create such relentless excitement, filling the screen with fireworks as he matches the blazing talents of these two great stars in the love affair of the year. Look, John, hold them, diamonds. Have you ever had a better offer in your whole life? One with everything. Alfred Hitchcock, and I would like to tell you about my forthcoming lecture. It is about the birds and their age-long relationship with man. It will be seen in theatres like this across the country. In my lecture, I hope to make you all aware of our good friends, the birds. Theirs is a noble history, and through it all, man has played a conspicuous part. This cave drawing is one of man's earliest sketches of his feathered friend. One can see at once the loving care with which the artist depicted his subject. The story of man and his friends, the birds, is filled with many fine examples of ways in which these noble creatures have added to the beauty of the world. Take this plumed hat from the period of Charles I. How proud the birds must have been to have their feathers plucked out to brighten man's drab life. Here we have a later model, 
a refinement of the first. Here man, or rather woman, thought enough of the birds to have an entire one as a decoration. It's quite dead, of course. Naturally, the egg plays a very prominent part in my lecture. Not a word about which came first, however. I don't believe in dealing with controversial matters. Thousands of years ago, man was satisfied merely to steal an egg from a nest and use it for food. Now he has perfected this process by imprisoning each hen in a separate cage and by scientifically manipulating the lights so that she doesn't fall into the rut of the old 24-hour day. Thus, he can induce the bird to reach fantastic heights of egg production. Originally, there were many varieties of birds on Earth. Some have become extinct. The great auk, the passenger pigeon, and the famous dodo bird have all disappeared. Actually, they didn't exactly disappear. They were simply killed off. But of course, this is nature's way. Man merely hurries the process along whenever he can be of help. Man and birds have been responsible for a great many advances in our civilization. For example, the bird was the inspiration for the invention of gunpowder, and it was his speed that brought about the development of the shot. But man has not been unmindful of his debt to the bird. We have honored our feathered friends in many ways. We cage birds and show them off proudly in most of our zoos. And the turkey is traditionally our guest of honor at Thanksgiving. I suspect you never realize that if it weren't for birds, even some of our pastimes would suffer noticeably. Duck hunting, for example. Granted, bagging a fellow hunter can be diverting, but the supply is rather limited. I hope you don't mind if I have something to eat, but I'm rushed today. Planning the lecture has been most educational for me. I've begun to feel very close to the birds and have developed a real sympathy for our little... What was I saying? Oh, yes, I've come to feel very close to the birds and I've come to realize how they feel when... I don't think I'll eat just now. Hardly proper with all of you here. Surely the birds appreciate all we've done for them. Don't you? Beautiful cage, fresh water, no other birds to bother you, none of that blinding sunlight. Oh! Now, why would he do that? Most peculiar. What on earth? Gentlemen, this is Johnny Jones of the Globe Syndicate speaking to you from Amsterdam, Holland, where I've been an eyewitness to the assassination of the Dutch cabinet minister Van Meer, the key figure of European politics. An hour ago, I arrived from London by plane to meet Van Meer. As I waited for him on the steps of the Peace Palace, he alighted from his car and made his way toward me. Halfway, he was stopped by a news photographer who asked for a picture. Van Meer consented and was shot dead by a revolver held close to the photographer's camera. Bystanders rushed to Van Meer's aid, and I pursued the assassin through the crowd only to lose him in traffic. Follow that car. Quick. Say, you better get out of here. This might be dangerous. This is silly, Bible. What's the trouble? Who's he shot? Van Meer assassinated. Did? Yeah. Looked like it. Yeah. There 
there you are, my boy. Oh! I'm afraid you'll have to keep the girl there much longer than we planned. But that's absolutely impossible. I think you better keep the girl there for the rest of the night. Well, I can't very well explain, but I simply couldn't pull a thing like that. If you knew how much I loved you, you'd faint. I tell you? Joel McRae, Lorraine Day, Herbert Marshall, George Sanders, Albert Vasserman, Robert Benjamin. <laughs> feeling of dizziness, a swimming in the head. Figuratively, a state in which all things seem to be engulfed in a whirlpool of terror, as created by Alfred Hitchcock in the story that gives new meaning to the word suspense. I don't want to die. There's someone inside me. She says I must die. Scotty, don't let me go. A beautiful girl haunted by the desperate, unexplainable urge to destroy herself. A man possessed by the paralyzing vertigo that made him afraid of high places. Easy now. I oh, know, I oh, know. Ah, well, this is a cinch. Here, I look up, I look down. I look up, I look... What was the strange attraction that brought these two together in spite of the dark forces that tore them apart? The specter from the past that drew her to the ancient headstone in the mission graveyard. The compulsion that drove her relentlessly to the point of no return. The story of a love so powerful it broke down all barriers between past and present, between life and death, between the golden girl in the dark tower and the tawdry redhead that he tried to remake in her image. If I let you change me, will that do it? If I do what you tell me, Will you love me? Yes. All right. All right, then I'll do it. They don't care anymore about me. 